Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Founders Grit. I am Zanura Bas Khan, and today we have Michael Benzikin with us, the CEO of Warrior Advisory. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Okay, Michael, how about you share a brief background of yourself and your work experience with us? Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'll take it back to education. In uh, college, I studied behavioral neuroscience because I wanted to know kind of what drives us, right? Because I wanted to start a company and to know how to manage people properly as incentives and drives. So I started off at Franklin and Marshall in behavioral neuroscience. And uh, then I moved on and I actually broke my back uh, <laughs> about halfway through. Wow. Can't really break your back, but yeah, you can't really break your back, but like, you know, my, my back was not usable. So what I had to do was recover. And so I taught myself exercise therapy. And then before I went back to college, I became a trainer for a bit. So I got to apply what I learned about behavior and incentives to either groups of individual customers or groups of trainers who I would oversee and got to develop a culture that way. So, you know, tried and tested uh, education in incentives and behavior and mindset and the outcome. Very interesting. I hope your back's fine now. We all good. It's getting there. It's getting there. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. So to know. Every day I do a little something. Uh, yeah. And then so I ended up going into international business, um, focused on pharmaceuticals and diagnostics, medical device. Uh, I worked with the United Nations, uh, with PAHO. I found my way towards the hill at times. So I got to know how government procurement worked. Uh, and then from there, uh, CEO and uh, chairman of the board. So I got to drive the direction of the company. We had about 200 employees. And the cool part was because you guys focus on remote management and the future of remote uh, employment, say, or contracting, we had offices around the world. And so each office was in you know, a different continent. We had several in Latin America, one in Southeast Asia, one in uh, uh, Europe, uh, one in the Middle East. So, so we had to learn the different cultures and at the same time with just proper time management, learn how to communicate in a way where each of the little cultures did not become fiefdoms on their own but were part of a coherent unit. Uh, so a tribe, if you will. So uh, I would apply tribal best practices to the company in order to create the culture and therefore the productivity and the type of uh, brand awareness that we were looking to achieve. So that was fun. Uh, not too long ago, I ended up selling my position and uh, leaving uh, the company in, in good hands and started putting together with a few partners of mine, a charity hybrid 501c3 and a C-Corp. So that means we have both a for-profit entity and we have a charitable entity. Because our idea is that if you couldn't self-fund your charity, then there's always an underlying suspicion in my mind if this charity is just looking to pay its founders or its executive team or whatever, versus actually you know, satisfying a cause or, or meeting a certain series of objectives. Uh, and so that's launching very soon under Warrior Inc. And uh, we'll be posting teasers and a video series where the aim is to walk people through in a non-technical way uh, into the block, uh, blockchain decentralized, if it's finance, if it's data sharing, if it's social, whatever is highly centralized today, just like any institution over time, it sort of erodes, right? It's uh, original mission erodes. So if you decentralize, now you have cultures that are competing, wanting to be the best culture. So it allows for group actualization, like the best version of that group through a series of checks and balances, right? It's like a free market, but in a virtual system emerges. Uh, which is just just amazing thing that's going to change the world as we know it. Uh, we don't know quite how, but we can we can speculate. And anyway, so so you know that's what I did, and that's what I'm doing. Well, kudos to you, Mike, and best of luck. Best of luck. Thank just you. know that we are here to help. And whenever you're launching your teasers and videos, send those our way as well. I'd love to. Thank you. 
Okay, so what has been your experience with remote employment, both as doing the work remotely yourself as well as employing remote workers? So personally, as a, so the last, you know, five, 10 years, I've been in an executive role. And so that's just very lonely as it is. And so you, know, you don't have a lot of cohorts, maybe in your board, or maybe you join, become membership of like the YPO or another organization like this where you can relate to people. So remote working, especially on your own, is very lonely. Uh, but in terms of the future, based on what we've seen the government respond to uh, the, uh, the COVID uh, situation, and just on being competitive globally uh, and outsourcing, especially uh, services and manufacturing, you might see a change in trend, but that's the direction now. Uh, you have to learn how to do remote employment or contracting the right way. And so how do I feel about it? I feel it's necessary. I feel that there could be an advantage, especially for small and small to medium sized you know, SME companies like my former company. And I feel that the unilaterally from the board down needs to understand that they have a responsibility to their stakeholders, you know, their employees and their customers to make them feel despite being remote, especially the employees, that they're a part of the tribe, that they're a part of the group. Uh, and so you really have to go above and beyond from a systems level, a communications level uh, to be able to make them feel like they're part of a coherent say tribe with a singular mission. So they're not sort of their own fiefdom, right? But they're part of something bigger than the sum of each other. So that, that's, that's work and there's an art to it. Interesting. So what has your takeaway been from such an experience? My takeaway is that people don't quite know yet how this is gonna all turn out. I mean, so because the, the the pandemic COVID was just a shock, you know, to the economy and to the psychology. And from a psychological standpoint, for those who are still employed, they're, you know, they could be doing a lot better, right? It, it, it's not the best. Uh, but then also at the same time for a small to medium sized company to be able to succeed, they have to be able to outsource if it's, let's say commodities or pseudo commodity type manufacturing. Uh, or some of these services that are growing as a barrier to entry. So before you didn't need a team that managed, you know, 10 social media platforms to be able to speak to a customer base. It just, you didn't need it, but now you, you do, you do need it. So there's a lot of automation, you know, they have these bots and these kind of gamified ways to grow these platforms, but that's not a way to really in, get in touch, right? Create raving fans. Because the idea is to have raving fans as customers and employees be raving fans, but of, of the company and its mission. So how do I feel? I feel like we, some people are gonna do it right. Some people are not. And so we're gonna be seeing something take shape. And especially with this decentralized, say ecosystems that are arising through blockchain, uh, that's gonna expedite. So whatever the remote working is, where people are all, say, uh, coordinating and not being next to each other, but we'll, we'll find out quickly. It, the incentives have to be in place. And the beauty of the blockchain is a trustless economy. It's sort of, say, self-executing. But outside of blockchain and the normal, you know, yet to be involved, you know, world of, of uh, let's say, finance or, or marketing, it really, it, it, does, it does depend a lot on what sector you're in they're gonna to have to take active measures so that it's not just individuals working remotely on their own as agents, but let's say hubs. So like a virtual hub with a physical presence, right? That knows additional cost, but that cost is going to come back in retention and attracting better talent and having better performance with your talent. So I think we're gonna move from the really balkanized or itemized uh, contractor uh, agent type of model, which you're seeing now, into an employment for the cost reasons why I said before, and pragmatically just for effective communication and, and productivity towards hubs, virtual hubs. So, so, so that's takeaway. We're trending towards virtual hubs. So there's little teams 
And then we're going to create systems that allow those teams not to be islands, but to be part of a coherent whole where, again, uh, it, it, the pieces are greater than the sum of the parts, right? The, the whole is greater than the sum. Got it. So what do you think is the future for more employment? What do you think needs to be done differently to make it even better and more effective? See, I, I, hubs. I mean, that, that, that's really it. You can't expect people to be on their own and to have the same level. So again, let's go back to my education. My education is, is behavior and neuroscience. So what are our fundamental drivers? So we have three fundamental drivers, the way I see it, and the way you know, that science kind of uh, lays it out for us. There's fear. So fear is a very, very powerful incentive. So fear that you're not going to have employment or that uh, you're going to be rejected from uh, your tribe or larger society or, you know, whatever the fear is, there's an existential crisis that you feel is happening and you're not in control. So fear is a driver. Number one, uh, two is financial. So the financial is a huge incentive. And number three is social recognition. So sometimes even social recognition could be more powerful than let's say a financial bonus. Now, people who are living hand to mouth, they'll say that's ridiculous. But for those people who are in, let's say the upper middle class, you know, combined household income of 65K a year, they pay their taxes, they have their kids. I mean, these are the people that's going to hit the most is that their recognition amongst their cohorts, their peers within their tribe is very powerful. So when someone does something right and you want to have people see what they're doing and then follow suit, right? Also do the right thing. Uh, it's about social recognition. And if you have these fiefdoms all over the place, as opposed to these hubs that are connected, you're able to leverage that system that connects them to be able to give them the social recognition that they need to be able to be, let's say, role models to the rest of the people throughout the company. You know what? I absolutely love your answers. Like, they're, they're so well structured and so smart. I am impressed. I'm a fan, Mike. I'm a fan. <laughs> well, then, well, then you will love Warrior Inc. because it's all built up on, on these uh, core fundamentals. So thank you. Well, virtual claps for you. you. All right. So you sold your equity position and transitioned out as chair and CEO yeah. role from your former company to focus on something entirely new. What is the story behind your very ambitious startup, Warrior Inc? And what has the journey been so far? Like any ups and downs, well, like any hurdles? Yes. Okay, yeah, so, so in brief, from the philosophical standpoint, whenever you have a nexus of power of influence, an institution, right? Something that has impact on institutions around it or groups or the public around it, even the culture, right? So over time, institutions increase, consolidate power, so they increase in their influence. And based on that, they become beholden to, let's say, um, third parties. And over time, their mission and their behavior becomes misaligned. So they're no longer doing what it is that the founder, even if it's still there, uh, originally intended. So the idea is to understand the nature of the institution, and then to be able to check it by a systems level approach that prevents uh, not the, the acquisition of influence and power, however you want to see it, really it earned merit at that point, but to be able to keep these, these groups, these units continually aligned with their mission uh, while in, being recognized for their merit, for their productive uh, output. And, and that's when we move into the world of, of again, blockchain, transparency, um, you know, taking these distal parts and making them a virtual free market. So no matter how it is, in the, I'm gonna call it the real world as opposed to the virtual world, the virtual world can provide uh, one where government regulation uh, doesn't crush, crush innovation, where institutions can continue through a series of checks and balances and because they're more transparent, there's more effective ways to see what they're doing and to measure what they're doing. All their transactions are on a public ledger, codified since the very beginning. The first move they made uh, all the way up to current, it could all be analyzed and you know, interpreted 
and, and discussed and a narrative around it. So, so it's essential, and I think it's a trend that we're going to see, that there's going to be more trust in institutions who put themselves on the blockchain. Not to say that from a business standpoint, it's great for them in the short term, because not everything put into a decentralized ecosystem is going to benefit from it. But that in the future, specifically NGOs, so charitable organizations who they accept money from third parties, maybe they have a good story, maybe they have a good board, uh, a good vision, but do they follow through on it? You know, what's, what's, the, what's the outcome? What's the productive outcome? So if you recall what happened in Haiti, maybe it's a decade ago, I'm sort of dating myself, uh, I'm not that old, but like, yeah, there was a big earthquake in Haiti. <laughs> There was a big earthquake, and and so we were in you know medical devices and diagnostics, and so we had this idea of leaving the containers behind and making them temporary shelters, and then just having these ways to sanitize it and separate it, so you know whatever was spreading couldn't spread fast. And it would be secured. It, it was everything you know they needed plus what was in it, it was, you know the diagnostics and the generic pharmaceuticals and medical devices. And what happened was there was all these institutions that were getting tons of money, if it's from the government, if it's from the private sector, if it's from these kind of joint private sector government commissions that just kind of determine where these allocations of funds from the, effectively the taxpayer go to, uh, it did not have the, the sum of the money put in did not in any way equal the outcome of what happened through the procurement process and the distribution process of goods and services. So, I mean, that's a great example of looking back and saying, yes, institutions over time, they're misused or they move away from the mission with which they were originally chartered. And now they become a tool that's not gonna strengthen the culture or, or, or the people who partake, but it's gonna weaken it. And, and, and so uh, we could have sheltered people, we could have secured people with our partnerships and, made sure that especially the women there, there, there was a lot of risk for them because things were chaos you know and it, that could have been avoided if or minimized if the allocation of funds if the funds were spent actually went to where they were supposed to go and by that i mean even if 50 percent of them were actually you know uh, invested in the area it was supposed to uh, if you go to u.s aid u.s aid is the united states takes about one percent of its gdp which is pretty massive, and then it puts it towards U.S. aid. They can call it soft diplomacy. That goes into two areas. It goes into uh, economic development, which is supposed to be temporary, uh, and it go goes into, let's say, disaster management, right? When something bad happens, you know, they tender on the spot. So with my relationship way back when in my, you know, former life uh, with some people that are in that space, procurement, U.S. aid on the Hill, uh, they may not work there anymore, they may work there now, you know, whatever, but they told me uh, and a couple of my cohorts that uh, 35 cents on every dollar are received in the form of goods or services by the intended recipient. That's on USAID, right? And USAID, you would imagine, has more oversight. So what does that mean? So figure a thick margin, figure 35% margin. This shouldn't be the margin on this type of thing, but let's just say that's what it is. You have round numbers, 30 cents on every dollar, that is disappearing in, in, in the transaction between the NGO, the private sector, and, and the government. And, and, and so how can you improve the world? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you do what Warrior Inc. is going to start doing is that our ledger, because we're 501c3, we're accepting people's money. So we're responsible for the outcome. The ledger is public. So they can see where our money went. They can see to whom it went to what product, and they could also see through some maybe third party analysis, what the ultimate outcome of our efforts were. Were we worthy of that donation or not? There's so many philanthropists right now who don't know what to do because they understand the nature of the institution and how it arose over time, right? So, so blockchain promises us that this is capable. So the $100, that then was received in goods and services, and let's say it should have been 50 cents with the margin. Now it can be like 70 cents on the dollar, 80, 90. What does that mean? That means 
less people are starving. You're alleviating meaningless suffering around the world. You're finding out what economic development does, right? So short term is great. A boost, a catalyst is excellent. But you know, the old saying is, is uh, give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, teach him how to fish, you know, he'll eat for a lifetime and his tribe will eat for a lifetime. It's economic development can be used as a weapon, right? It, it really can to destroy local economies, uh, even some foreign disaster relief. So at least it gives us the data, the data to say, no matter what side you fall on politically, that doesn't even matter. It's just like, you have a dollar, you have a need, your dollar is going to that need. Is it really going to that need? And, and what's the outcome? We can find that out. We're at the age, like the golden age, right? Of, of a new type of financial system, a new type of say organizational management with remote uh, working, a new type of transparency. There's this big discussion now, the shareholder versus the stakeholder. I'm still a Milton Friedman type guy. The shareholder has to be paramount or else the next company where the shareholder is will just eat the other company, acquire it, and then it's over. But there must be both a top-down and bottom-up impact on the governance of that entity. And, and, and so now we're going to learn what works and what doesn't work. If we accept it, that's something entirely different. If that information is going to get out, that's entirely different, right? So I mean, that's again, when you have media that's centralized, it's not going to tell you something that's antithetical to their best interest because their business, like anything else, and that has to be understood, and that makes sense. So, so we'll see. But it's a very exciting time to be alive. It is. It is. All right. So, how did you incorporate the idea for more than your mode of working? How did you come up with it? Was it like one day you woke up and you were like, "I need to go remote," or was it Corona? Did Corona force you to go remote? Yeah, so, I mean, fortunately, during my time when I was managing the SME Life Science multinational, like that, it, it was remote by nature because we just had offices that had to be in these different geographic regions in order to take place, uh, to take part of the tendering process where they're bidding on government or supranational, like the United Nations or whatever contracts. So that was by necessity. But remember, these were offices, there were physical offices, there were hubs. And they were developing the culture. So when I came in, they were sort of separated. And the result of that meant that it wasn't producing as well. But once we connected it through some amount of standardization, through revamping, you say, internal branding, right? So the, the, the culture and the communications uh, systems are huge, right? So these, how you man these management information systems, the ERPs in there, and how they could be tied in, yes, that's centralized but also it allows for standards. In a world where people are trying to remove standards from the equation of an analysis, if something is worth doing or not, that's very dangerous, right? That's very dangerous. Even the stock market today, it's not based on standards anymore. The multiples on the value of companies, right? Change really based on whim, you know, on emotion. And that's even on the street, right? So even on Wall Street, where, on Wall street, where they're like, um, these are supposed to be the guys to sort of determine the standards and even them it's sort of a postmodern approach. So, so bringing standards back into systems and then have people interact with those systems I think is going to be extremely helpful, especially if that interaction with the standard, you know, that data is aggregated and the public knows what's the best approach to do whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, it's just now that you have the data against the standard, you can measure it. What's the best practice, right? Which institutions are doing things the right way? Which individuals, well, not down to the individual because we have our privacy, but yeah, groups, institutions, and uh, processes, right? anything that can be measured against the standard. That's the key. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, due to the ongoing pandemic, right? Many companies have been forced to go remote, like even schools are online these days. In a situation such as this, what are the major roadblocks and challenges? So for the economy or for education or for everything? For everything. So we're, we're pack creatures. I mean, we're, so we're not so much 
a psychological being, but a social psychological being. Mm -hmm. So we are part of a group. And so for those companies who aren't aware of that, or those schools who aren't aware of that, uh, these people, these individuals are, are, are going to suffer uh, until they realize that even if remote is necessary or or even beneficial, because I mean, it can be for companies, the only thing that allows you to get ahead is to have a cost advantage, right? And so you can do that by, by outsourcing, especially startups, right? Because, uh, you know, especially the US economy is not friendly to startups, right? Even the Chamber of Commerce is not so friendly to startups. It's not, right? I mean, there's a lot of regulation that's making it nearly impossible for someone to worship themselves to thrive, go from a small company to, to a small to medium size to a medium size. So really, the, the 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 good fortune favors the one the ones who have all the assets and all all the the power and influence that they need. So the aim at this time is to be able to create systems that allow individuals to form into groups or tribes. And so whenever you have a tribe, it encapsulates or it circles something stays sacred, right? So so what's sacred in the company? is essentially the vision. We're going to do this, like, so here's our goals, this is our mission, but the vision is as a result of completing our mission is this is how we're gonna impact the individual, the group, the community, the nation, the world, and the world over time. So that's that's you know something sacred with which people can, can circle around. So we need, say, groups, uh, we need individuals to create groups around something sacred that, that's worthwhile so uh, Warrior Inc., our aim is the pursuit of truth. I mean, so the pursuit of truth and the, say, uh, unmolested historical record, right? So that, you know, what happened, happened. And we're not going to change it tomorrow because of how it makes us feel. This is what happened, right? We can go back, we can challenge it, we can do all these things. So if Warrior Inc. is one example of an individual who formed a group around something that they found to be sacred or purposeful or meaningful. And, and so as long as you have that sacred, that, that, that the meaning, the purpose, as long, as long as you have something meaningful, then you have purpose. If the individual has purpose, then they're going to thrive. So if you want in a increasingly, say, remote working world, right, that you need something of great meaning whereby they can get purpose, especially if there's then reinforcement, financial, social recognition, right? And it satisfies some kind of existential uh, threat that's perceived. These three things will result in the best self-actualization for the individual and in the as aggregate, you know, the group or the say virtual institution, right? So like a, a bunch of people who stake in digital assets, that's what they do, they, they stake, some money in here around something that has some value. And then the idea is at the end of this period of time that they leave with you know, higher interest. So higher, higher value or at least preserved principle. So it's so, sort of that idea is bringing people around something that's meaningful. Uh, they will derive purpose from that. They're going to avoid the, the negative downside of isolation, which is essential. I mean, it, it, oxytocin, I don't know the difference of oxytocin, the, the love chemical uh, between us seeing each other personally or seeing each other remotely, but there's something that tells me that there is an end. And so cohesion and productive output as a result of cohesion is going to be a challenge. The solution to that challenge is blockchain technology. How precisely what's the mechanism that's going to solve that challenge? We don't know yet, but we should pursue that. That should be our area of greatest pursuit uh, at, at this time that we're all sort of collectively living through. I'm gonna send more virtual virtual claps toward you, like virtual claps for you, Mike. I absolutely love how you're answering each and every question. I absolutely love it. It's like you're actually interested, you know? You're not trying to get rid of it. You actually have ideas, you actually have a view. Love it, I absolutely love it. Okay, moving on. So there are companies like Gaper that help develop, build, and scale products, especially for startups. How important do you think such setups are in the start, uh, important for the startup world and for founders looking to hire 
quickly and smart. So uh, what, what, you're doing, what you're doing to the extent that it reflects sort of what we've been discussing, right, is, is to be able to have people form a community around something meaningful, it's the most necessary. Because in terms of survival today, and I, and I, I sort of mean physical survival, but, but more than that, just like uh, the prolonging of a company, of an institution, of a whatever, an idea, you need to be able to take these pieces that are far apart, that have these shared first principles, and who are all dedicated to protecting whatever is sacred. So, so what you guys are doing is the future, how you go about doing it, you know, so, I mean, that, that will determine, you know, are, are you going about it through the way that, that we discussed, whether you create the sacred and the social recognition? I mean, I don't know too much about hiring. That's always been my greatest challenge. So the solution for me is that I create something and then I see who comes around it. So instead of me reaching out, they're reaching out. So you have, there's, there's a vetting issue, right? So because you have to go through a qualification process because, you know, so there's a lot of people in this world and sometimes what job you're looking to fill uh, is niche or like super niche, you know, it's like being able to uh, interpret a smart contract, you know, you know, I mean, come on, you know, this is like coding stuff that no one knows really how to do. It's like 1% of people and, and they're making a killing because they know how to do that. Uh, to be able to create something, an idea that's important for the right people to come to you, the right demographic to come to you is key. Uh, and, and, and that will, I think, ultimately determine your success. So create something of, of real meaning uh, and then convey that meaning in as a productive way as, as possible by using existing infrastructure. I mean, it's, it, these, no matter how you feel about Silicon Valley, we've created this, this interconnected web of, of communication channels. And as insofar that you play by the game or the rules or how, whatever you want to say, whatever they deem accessible, you use the right language, you can create these nexus, this, this, these different nexi, I suppose, of important things for this sector, for that sector, for this sector, for that sector, and so forth. And then the right people come to you. And then as long as you're, you've scaled your qualification process, then, I mean, that's the future of hiring. That's the future of human resources. Scouting, I don't think is the future. Sniping might be, uh, because that'll always be from existing companies. Uh, but in terms of just attracting the public at large, it's establishing these next side, I'm assuming that's what it is, multiple nexuses, right, of uh, sectors for people to come to you. That, that would be the challenge. That would be the challenge. And if you figure that out, you will be unbelievably successful, especially if your company formation is structured so that it allows you to have, say, you know, uh, uh, heightened growth. Hmm, very wise, very well. Okay, so final words in the state of the economy today and your new startup. Yeah, so, okay, so I mean, there's the real economy and, and the fake economy, that's how I see it. There's the economy of material goods and service, really goods and services being produced. And then there's how that's valued on uh, Wall Street and then speculation, or whatever. So in, in terms of the real economy, the real economy needs a lot of work. We need to move away. So I'm speaking from a US centric point right now, from a strictly service-based, even like very esoteric, esoteric niche service-based uh, economy uh, over back to producing some, to manufacture. Now that's very difficult to do. So it, it couldn't be like a pseudo commodity, like a medical device. Of course there should be, uh, because there wouldn't be a, a the, on, on the global stage, you, you can't be competitive in regards to price. Um, but uh, if we take sensible legislative, uh, say reform, to be able to allow small companies to move into SMEs, to medium sized, allow these guys, everyone's always talking about this equity thing. And I, I'm strongly ideologically against equity, which means you cut down the the tallest grade of uh, blade of grass, right? So you stop the actualization. But I am for access. I'm for access, like giving as many inroads to as many people who can, right? Giving people without banks and, and, and a foreign currency that's too volatile to let's say afford a mortgage, give them the ability to mine 
with their cell phone um, something that will produce value and then allow them to invest. So, so give them at least the chance, the chance. So don't guarantee them by government fiat, right? But you give them the chance to go and succeed. So insofar, our economy, our real economy, focuses on, on a systems level, a macro level. How do we make this work? Uh, and I'm not going to give the solutions because then it's obvious divisive because people, they, they all want less meaning, less suffering, uh, but they disagree on how to get there, right? For me, I'm a Milton Friedman guy. I believe in free market. I believe that even what Europe did in regards to medical devices through its ISO, uh, TUV ISO combo, um, to make sure that things are of sufficient quality uh, is a superior approach over what the US FDA does, which makes it impossible to come up with a non-derivative drug that academia does, which makes it impossible for you know some of those brilliant academics out there to publish a paper. Because to publish, you need people to join you. And for people to join you, they don't want to be tarnished by you doing something that the system doesn't want you to do. What does the system want you to do? Again, institutions become corrupt over time. It wants you to do something derivative. It doesn't want you to do something that can potentially, let's say, heal somebody. <laughs> it, it, you know, because I mean, that's bad for the bottom line. Why would, why would they, right? And academia and the private sector, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a, a clear marriage there, especially in Silicon Valley and like Columbia, for a very clear marriage there. So uh, again, the solution to the real economy is going to start with blockchain. The solution to the fake economy, I don't think there is one. The direction that we're moving in in terms of monetary policy and quantitative easing and the failure of the central banks, again, institutions failing over time to the main uh, central banks, I, I think we're going to see inflation. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, God forbid, but you know, there may be hyperinflation. The dollar may shift from the reserve currency. Uh, that's going to be traumatic. Uh, we can't just print money anymore and it has to be no effect. Already people, their, their dollar, I mean, it's, it's not 2% uh, lost uh, due to inflation. I mean, it's like, look at how prices are, just think about what a phone costs today, like an iPhone, like amazing piece of, you know, that's the free market at work there with the creation of the iPhone or else you'd have like a cement block that you're talking to yourself, right? So it's a beautiful, beautiful piece of technology uh, it's dependent, you know, on on other countries, so we need to play nice. But I mean, if we take this time to understand that there is a technology that allows us to be able to preserve wealth, then we can mitigate the damage being done by the central banks. Uh, the reserve currency, I don't want it to go into a basket of fiat. Fiat means government enforced. So the, the money that you have is called fiat currency. By definition, it means government enforced currency. It doesn't mean value. It has nothing to truth to it. It is just government enforced if they you know, store a value, if you will. And it's the worst store of value. So if you have $5 today, right now, and five seconds later, you just lost value, right? That's not how it should work. People aren't going to, to thrive when they're <laughs> currently money, and they're losing value, right? Whatever the food was. Yeah. So it's like, so I hope that the future is based on a reserve currency that is, let's say, so I mean, I'm a big fan of digital assets, a big fan. I think that uh, Bitcoin was brilliant. I think that blockchain is the most brilliant thing for the 21st century it will reshape the world more than AI. And AI will be born out of blockchain and the competition that it will be able to bring. It will. The best machine learning will be born out of blockchain because it's just incentives. It's incentives incarnate and it allows for the joining together of people in a time where people are divided. They both, so many people want the same thing because they see the same meaning of suffering and they're just convinced that, that they're so different that they should be attacking each other. This is the world we live in today, divided. And the division is false. When you take a look at what each wants, before it says how to get there, because how to get there is the propaganda. What people want, it's almost always the same thing. It's always almost the same thing. So, you know, Warrior Inc. and the pursuit of truth, we want to be able to just be able to show people 
that they mostly want the same thing. And over time, we'll know through the data and the transparency of the data, again, taking place based on a standard or st you know, standards on the blockchain and open ledger, we'll know what works. And if we're really concerned with what works, we the people, not the people who communicate the analysis of you know, the, 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 the activity around the standard, just cut them out. They're the middleman. <laughs> they don't need them anymore, right? So that you have a whole bunch of people now competing essentially to do an accurate and reliable interpretation of events. So we'll learn what works. And if that's important to us, we will change the world. We will change the world and in, in, we will have a golden age unlike we've ever had the opportunity in the past just tenfold. Uh, and it could be very quick. We just need to be able to introduce the common person, the average Joe, into this blockchain and digital asset space that it doesn't threaten him or they don't feel like they're going to be um, manipulated or tracked or you know, there's a lot of these conspiracy theories around it. I mean, it, it, think about it like a gun. It can be used to save a civilization or it can be used to destroy a civilization, right? So that's why the, the average Joe needs to be introduced. So we heard about the, this great reset that's happening. I call it the people's reset. But if the people don't get involved, they'll have absolutely no say into what world their children will live in. So it's just like, no. It's, you know, I work today, when I'm 60, I plant the almond tree because if I want to live a good life, I have to leave at least a prospect of my grandchildren having a better life as a result of what I've done during you know, the few precious years that we're given. And so anyway, yeah, the direction of the real economy versus the, the fake economy, um, blockchain, blockchain and digital assets, <laughs> that's the key. That's the key. And, and, and mass adoption, that's the goal. Well, Mike, it was an absolute pleasure having you on, uh, on our show, but I have to ask you this. How can sure. investors and other interested party get in touch with you? So uh, we've done, we've gone through like an enormous, say, effort to avoid being bad at customer service because so many people are reaching out to us and we just don't have the staffing yet because, I mean, we've, we're still in the formation process for a whole bunch of reasons. So uh, please excuse our delayed response, but by getting in touch with us at Warrior, W-A-R-R-I-O-R, advisory, A-D-V-I-S-O-R-Y, uh, at protonmail.com, right? It's one of these really awesome companies, by the way. If you're not in the protonmail.com uh, universe, uh, you, should, you should get in it, it's amazing. Um, it's a great company, you know, absolute great company out of Switzerland. Shoot us an email. Uh, you have some people sort of standing by, there's a huge backlog. So please accept our apologies in advance. But if you can make a good subject line, then we move up the queue. So at least we know what it's about. <laughs> that always helps. That always helps. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. Thanks once again. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much Likewise. for coming Likewise. to our show. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Have a Anytime. great day, Mike. Have a great day. Bye. Okay.